doing a little bit of a recap tonight over the past couple months. Um, I'm going to go over a list. I, I made a short, short list. I toned it down. I had a lot of stuff on there, but I decided to, to take some stuff off for the sake of time and for remembering things. But there's a longer list. There's a much longer list. But this is a short list of some of the events that uh, happened in the life of Jesus. And we're, we're just going to go over it quick. And then after that, I have um, an assessment for you tonight, an assessment, which is not going to be like the one that when we did on Sunday morning, I gave you a test. And um, I just know that Sister Pat's going to get a zero tonight. So we can all tell her that she got the lowest grade in the class. Just glad we got that out of the way. I wrote a, a question, how has Bible study helped you? And she said, uh, it reaffirms what I already know. So we're going to do a little bit of assessment, a little bit differently than last time, though, because I'm going to actually put the questions up on the screen tonight, and then we'll go over it quick, and then what we're going to do after that is you're going to write down the answers on your paper. So if you have a pen, you could, you could help me out and, and use your pen if you have one, and if you don't, I'll give you something to write with. And what we'll do is we'll go over the questions, and you'll write down the letter, and if you, if you want, if you'd like me to grade it, I, you can hand it in to me, or else you can self-grade it. It's up to you, and, and I really have no preference either way. That's just up to you. Uh, most of it is stuff that we covered in Bible study. Some of it is stuff about the writing of the Bible that I might not have put a lot of emphasis on. So, so some of it is going to be easy for some people, and some, some might be a little harder. But the whole point of it is to learn things. I mean, for me personally... I learn things when I look at a question and don't know the answer and then figure, find out what the answer is. That's how I actually learn it. That's, it helps me a lot to remember things. I actually remember things better that way. It's always helped me in preparing for tests and remembering information. Sister K, you have cookies if you'd like a cookie on your way in. Praise God. I guess we'll, we'll open up in prayer tonight. If, uh, if you have any volunteers to pray. And then after that, I, I sent something out. I don't know how many of you looked at it. I didn't have a specific reading. I gave you a list of, I think, 40 different events in the life of Jesus. I put the scriptures there for you. And I said, if you'd like to, you could prepare to share something for about a minute or two tonight. And um, if some of you did that, you'll have the opportunity to share. And that, that's how we'll start, by recapping some of the great miraculous stories, some of the great things that happened here. Amen. So uh, we have any volunteers to open us up in prayer tonight? You got it, sir. Amen. Thank you. So to start off, basically what we've done so far is we've gone over the uh, what would be called, well, three of them are called, well, I'm giving you answers to the test now. That's all right. I'll give it to you because I didn't really talk about this much. There are four Gospels in the Bible. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels, meaning that they're a summary of the life of Jesus. Synoptic meaning a summary of the life of Jesus. John is a little different in that it's not considered a summary of the life of Jesus. It's more of a declaration of who Jesus is, that he is God. So we, we see different traits in each gospel. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they have a lot in common. They have a lot of the same stories. Sometimes they're worded very closely. They have a lot of accounts of the same events. You can look at the, the, all of them to get a, a good view of the whole picture. 
And um, you, you, you'll see that some of them, sometimes they're just a little bit different, but neither one negates the other. They're just different perspectives on the same event. We also see different traits in the writers, the way that they write. I mean, they were different people. So in other words, Matthew was a tax collector and he became a disciple of Jesus, one of the apostles. So he, he has a lot to do with the book of Matthew. Um, Mark, on the other hand, he comes around a little later and he, he uh, talks to Peter a lot and that's how he kind of gathers all his writings. And uh, well, first of all, with Matthew, the tax collector, what he did was he summarized everything that happened in the Old Testament and he made it make sense that Jesus had to be the Messiah. He was declaring that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the son of David, right? And the reason that Matthew did this was he's the first book of the New Testament. He's showing you that everything in the Old Testament is culminating here. And Jesus is the person that fulfills it all. And we see very, at the very beginning of Matthew chapter 1, the first few chapters, he's doing all of this uh, type of stuff. He's, he's talking about all of these fulfilled things. But in chapter 1, we see the genealogy. This one, beget that one. All the way, um, maybe, maybe to Abraham. He goes all the way down the list. And we see the same thing with Luke, the physician, who actually brings the genealogy all the way back to Adam. But with Matthew, we see that he's being declared the son of David. With Mark, Mark is showing a little bit of a different perspective. Jesus as a servant. What does that mean? In Mark, there's a lot of emphasis on the fact that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And we see this with the primary uh, example of him coming and dying on the cross. See, if he, if he came to be served, he wouldn't have done something like that. He wouldn't have put himself through all of that pain. But he came to be an example of how a Christian should be. And he gave up all, his own comforts to help us all out. Yes. In uh, Luke, he's a physician. So Luke's a physician, so he writes a little bit more technical. And um, he's got his own perspective. I believe it's the son of man. So he's showing us how God is man, how Jesus is man, how Jesus can relate to the struggles that we've been through. And he knows about human flesh and human condition, and he can relate to us as humans. And the Italian cookies that we're all asking for are here now. We'll have those later. That's all right. Don't be sorry. Now, John is, uh, is the fourth gospel. It's talking about how Jesus is the Son of God. For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son. Right? He's declaring that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the Son of God. John makes it very clear. John writes, John, he writes, what, other, what else does John write? The book of Revelations. He also writes 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. So he, he pens many books. Uh, Luke as well. Luke actually pens uh, the book of Luke. And also Acts would be part two of that. We're, we'll be getting into Acts after this. Acts is uh, after the life of Jesus. So they, they, they took it apart. They put Luke with the Gospels. And then they put Acts right after the Gospels. So go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And then Acts. They split Luke and Acts into two for chronological sake. So that's just a little history on the books, the declaration, their different points of views. Uh, if you ever hear somebody say something as silly as that the Bible uh, contradicts itself, it, it definitely doesn't contradict itself at all. It, it's very clear that there's just different perspectives on the same thing that happened. And it, it, if I'm looking at Sister Carrie from this perspective, I can tell you that she's wearing a certain color lipstick. But uh, Aunt, Sister Anne-Marie back there can tell me that she has a bun on her hair because she's looking at her from behind. So we have different perspectives. So we'll say something different, but both are true. So you look at all the Gospels and you get the big picture. This is kind of small here, so I, I don't know if we can read this stuff. Uh, events in Jesus' lifetime, the genealogy of Jesus, Gabriel announces to Mary, uh, decree of Augustus Caesar and the birth of Christ, 
first visitors were the shepherds, then the magi. Jesus was circumcised and presented in the temple. You know, Jesus was a practicing uh, Jew. He practiced the Jewish religion. He was a rabbi throughout his life. So, it, you know, what religion did Jesus follow while he was on earth? He was actually following Judaism very devoutly. And then Christianity became a thing after the resurrection. And then we see that Jesus came out of Egypt. He fulfills all these prophecies as we saw like Moses came out of Egypt. And we see Jesus doing a lot of the same things that the people, the nation of Israel went through in the past. Um, the boy at the temple, we don't hear a lot about his whole life before his ministry. But as a boy in the temple, he's very interested in talking to the rabbis and the priests, finding out about the word of God and, and the things of God. He was showing that he was a, a bright person and that he was very interested in these things. And he was about his father's business, giving us a little bit of a prequel to what's to come when his ministry would begin. And what has always been and always will be. And uh, Jesus is baptized, the temptation in the wilderness. He was tempted in all points as we are. And I mean, I, I, I could read all these, but I, I don't really want to. So um, I, have, I have 20 here and I have 20 on the other page. But did anyone prepare anything to, uh, to share with us based on the, uh, the remind that I sent out, that you prepared? I see you, Sister Denise. I'm just seeing if there's anybody else See you, Brother Sam. And, and there's a list here, so if there's something you'd like to share on, you, you can have a minute to talk about what happened or maybe the relevance of it, however you feel. Okay, so I got a list of about 20 here. The first disciples, turning water into wine. Unless one is born again, he had that conversation. Uh, the woman at the well, brought him to, they brought him a paralytic. Matthew, the tax collector, you know, he wasn't somebody that the Jews liked, and Jesus accepted him. Yes. The healing in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, they all told him that that was no good. But uh, he said, my father works on the Sabbath, he heals. He appoints the 12, the centurion servant, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. If anybody would like to share on anything that is uh, there, just for a minute, you, you can, we can do that one at a time. So I did see uh, two volunteers, so I, I saw that the, uh, Denise first. Let's we'll start with you. What, what do you have? I will uh, let John be born again. Jesus tells Nicodemus in John 3 how we can be born again. And unless we are born again, we will not see the kingdom of God. In order to enter into the kingdom of God, you must be born of water and of the spirit. Being born of water is water baptism. Is a public pro profession of a person's repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Being emerged in water in response to receiving salvation. Being born again of his spirit gives us a new life being the second works of a grace that empowers a person to, be, to live a Christian life and serve Christ. Being baptized means you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. And that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to condemn the world but to save it through him. So whenever believers in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned. Jesus is the light. Men love dark because of evil deeds. So love the light because darkness is evil and death. Amen. Right, absolutely. You have to accept Jesus to be born again. And, and this is a, another example of what I was getting at before, 
about how John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and uh, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then it talks about the darkness and the light, being the light of the world. And some people preferred to be in darkness because they, they didn't want it. They didn't want the revelation. So we saw a lot of resistance against that. We saw some people that w should have been uh, closest to God that were resisting it. And here's the message here. You have to be born again. You, you know, it, it's a lot more than just t doing the religious duties. You have to actually see that Jesus is God. You have to believe it and you have to accept it. That's the only way to be born again. Amen. That's the gospel truth right there. That's the gospel truth summed up for you. Amen. Amen. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'm glad you, you brought that one up. That was a good one. And then um, I guess we have Brother Sam. I, I guess for the sake of uh, the audio quality, we have a mic all the way over there, but I, I, don't, I don't know if it's going to get everyone around the room. The room's a little too big. So was there anybody else? I know Brother Sam was one. And I'm sorry to leave you out of this, Sister Denise, but you were the first one. But I think I'm going to give my mic over. That's all right. <laughs> it was nothing against heard. you. Everybody heard me. Yes, we, yeah, we did. I, I see you, Brother Sam. We got Sister Antoinette here. I'm going to walk over to her. You, you come on somewhere over here. I'll come to you, Brother Sam, in a minute. Well, I looked at uh, when Jesus was walking on the water, that if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we'll, we'll always stay above the water. So he'll always be there. And we have him that takes care of us. If we keep our eyes on him, it don't matter what happens around us. That's it. I was waiting for the punchy line. <laughs> and then he died. <laughs> and then he rose again. <laughs> That's very good. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Definitely keep your eyes on Jesus. He'll keep you above the water. Take your eyes off Jesus. You'll be consumed by the issues around you. The water was rough. The water is problems. The water is things going on in your life when, when you take your eyes off Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Stanton, that Brother Sam. Yes, I chose the 12 uh, because due to the fact it teaches you how to uh, go out and minister the word to people. Uh, as it started out further in the beginning of Matthew, Jesus was out healing the sick, you know, chasing out demons, and he was moved with compassion when he seen all the people there, you know, following him. And as he was walking away, he noticed they started to scatter abroad, and and so he prayed on it. And then he came back with his disciples, and he, he said, "Well, listen, uh, we're gonna need somebody, to, you know, to keep them together." in my absence. So he, he did the disciples. And um, Luke, they, he gave them, uh, um, ordained them as uh, apostles. But there's something in there that, that, that caught my eye. Thaddeus. Thaddeus was, uh, uh, he, he was one of the 12 disciples, but as an apostle, he never became apostle. He chose there's two Judas, one that betrayed him, and Judas Oscar, whatever his name is. That, that is the one that betrayed him. And, yeah, and um, the other Judas. Yes. So he took Timothy's place with Thaddeus, whatever his name is. And I'm like, wow. I had missed that before. I had to read that two or three times. I said, hold up. Somebody's missing. But I kept counting it up, and it was 12. And then it dawned on me. One was kicked out, and one was put in. Right. And then from Luke, and he, he, he begins Acts, Acts the same way. I read all three chapters again. I said, hold up now. I know I just put Thaddeus in, and then I got a good view that uh, Mark Allen and I said, the hold up, that's not the same. And then and, and Luke, I said on the end, it was two of our views. Yeah, I, I'm not, I, don't, I never saw that, but I, I think it's Theodophilus is what Luke says in the beginning of the chapter. Right. But Thaddeus here is definitely an apostle. And uh, there, there was a switch there. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot. <laughs> there was a switch, right? Anybody else? All right, Sister Megan. Uh, 
so talking about the centurion's servant, um, and I mean the whole moral of that, that the servant was sick and he's met up with Jesus, the centurion, and uh, saying, you know, my servant is sick, you heal him. And, and he said, sure, I'll come. But he said, no, but, you know, you're, I'm, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. Only you say the word and he'll be healed. And so Jesus was like, you know, I, I've never seen faith of, like this in all of, all of Israel. So, I mean, that we know that the Bible says faith as small as a mustard seed move mountain. So he, ha he had that faith without sight. And, um, and that's what we are called to have is, is that faith without, without seeing it. He believed it, and then Jesus said, you know, since you've believed, it is done. And his servant was healed, and, and that's just, it's, it's always so, so hard to, to believe without seeing, but, but this man did. So Jesus recognized that faith and said, it was best faith he'd seen. And he was, he was actually uh, astonished, or uh, I don't remember the exact word, but it was only used two times, and it was both times by faith, either the faith, the presence or faith or the lack of faith, where Jesus was actually like really taken back by his faith. And uh, this is a Gentile, you know, he's a centurion, and the type of faith he hasn't seen among all the people of Israel. So it really, Jesus was amazed by it. Come on in, don't, don't worry, we're... We're, we're relaxed tonight. We got cookies over there and anything you need. Just doing a little recap tonight. And um, absolutely. That's a good one too. The centurion. He had faith that with, without even uh, Jesus coming. He was humble. He was a good, good rep representation of the approach that we should take when we, we go to Jesus humbly and trusting in him. And he can perform miracles that way. Okay, anybody else? I, I think we're going to get to the, the test pretty soon for the sake of time. We'll, we'll do a couple more. Definitely get Sister Veronica in there because I think she, she tied for top score. But, I, with the old, but she might get the top record this time because Pat's whole average is going down. She's getting a zero tonight. She's going to be like a 40-something average after this. I was... Uh, Actually, I was thinking about this before you sent out the, uh, the, that pa sheet of paper, yeah. That, and I, I thought about, oh, we're going to go over the life of Christ. And uh, so the Lord brought me to when he was 12 years old, how he went, uh, he was, they went, his parents and he went to Jerusalem. And uh, after the parents were going, uh, he stayed behind and he was talking to all the wise men. And um, they were astounded at his knowledge. You know, he'd ask questions and, and they would answer, but he must have had a lot of things that he was talking about too because they were astonished at him. And what happened was after three days, um, his parents um, came back and they were like, it said they were astonished, like, what are you doing? And like thinking, what, what, did you, what did you do this to us for? And he said, don't you know I'm about my father's business? And... We had studied about um, the, uh, the disciples on the road to Aramaeus last week, and it was sort of very similar to the same thing. They were talking to Jesus about how it's been three days since uh, all this happened, and don't you know what's going on? And, and you know, he expounded about everything, and, and they even talked about how the women said that Jesus rose from the dead and we, that we were all astonished. So it's like Jesus always astonished people because they were looking at him in the natural and not in the spirit. Um, even the people that were closest to him, his parents, his disciples, his apostles, all these people didn't know what Jesus was going to do, even though the, all the Old Testament showed what he was going to do, and all, even his early childhood show, showed what he was going to do that after three days. And, you know, of course, Jonah and all that, the three days. So I think the, the, the thing for us is that we need to look at him in the spirit and not look in the natural and have that relationship with him that... We know what, what he wants us to do, and he, we know what he's going to do, and, and, um, and not be so surprised and, and astounded that God is God, and he's going to have his way, and he's going to do what he wants to do, and we just have to go along with it. <laughs> well said, well said.
Amen. Was anything? What? Deborah the judge? <laughs> Sister <laughs> Tina, you put your hand up? Uh, oh, did you already go? I didn't go. Oh, okay. I'll just find that something to talk about. Actually, I was thinking about the fig tree when um, Jesus and his disciples were walking along. And he seen the fig tree, and it looked, you know, great, like it was in bloom, ready to eat. And as they came upon it, he seen that there was no fruit, so he cursed the tree. And, you know, the disciples were wondering, why would you curse this tree? Why would you do that? And he says, because it kind of, like, represents religion or the religious leaders at that time or even ourselves if we we look good on the outside but yet we have no fruit and you know I think God it's not enough to just say I'm a Christian or I'm a believer or I go to church but God wants fruit in our lives and um, and I think that was what the parable was trying to say it's not good enough to just be good on the outside but we need to have that you know, that living water on the inside us and bringing forth fruit and uh, being a witness to others, you know? And like he said, if you have faith as a mountain, as, um, as a mustard seed, we can move mountains, same thing, you know? If we have faith, we can do these things and more just by believing. So, okay. <laughs> That's a very relevant word for today because a lot of people, I, I mean, yeah, I know there's a lot of churches that do. They're looking a little weird these days, but I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are looking holy, but they, they're showing the door to the Holy Ghost in the churches. So we do see that. The, uh, it's a very pre- a relevant word for today, that, uh, that they look good on the outside, but they're not actually bearing the fruit of what they look like they should be. A fig tree should be providing figs. That would be its purpose. And if it looked healthy, if you look like a Christian, it would mean that you had, you had Christ, you would have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That would be the fruit of being a Christian. You would have the Holy Spirit in you. And we do. We see it right now. It's very relevant. And it was very relevant at that time with all the religious people that they, they said, oh, this is not God. Maybe he has the devil to cast out devils. All this stuff they thought about Jesus, these are supposedly religious people. So I don't know where they missed it. But we gotta be, we got to be careful to you know, always go to Jesus. And, and make sure that we're praying in Jesus' name and we're doing the things that the Bible tells us yeah. and that we're not showing the Holy Ghost to the door, that the Holy yeah. Ghost is welcome. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Any other ones? You got one? Question. Question. Go. What, um, can you explain or give me an idea about what baptizing was in the old, as before Jesus was here? There was a, a lot of things that they did in the Old Testament that they would do as part of the Passover. You got something, Pastor Rob? Uh, it's up to you. Well, what I, well, I, well, well, sure. Yeah, you can hold that to the end. What, what I was going to bring up. Write it down, though, because I'll forget. <laughs> the only thing I was going to bring up about what he's saying is under the Old Covenant, they didn't have access to the Holy Spirit the way that we do with the New Covenant. Okay. So they, they did a lot of things out of uh, religious duties. They had a law that they had to follow. And if it said to baptize, they, they had to baptize it. And they had a lot of things. When they cured themselves, there were certain things they had to go with, with the leprosy. Or, or I think leprosy, they had to shave themselves, right? They had to run the water over the, the bird. They had to do all of these things because they were under the law. Right. But wasn't it a lot of repentance too, to repent from sin? Well, if you were repenting from sin, you had to do the baptize. things that the law told you to do. Yeah, well, I mean, certain crimes had certain punishments. The new covenant is a covenant of grace. Right. That's the one that we're living in. Right. Which means we don't have to do certain things. We have to do the main thing, which is God's got to be in it. It's got to be genuine. You have to really go to God and not just say it. He's not just going to give you a pass if you don't mean it. You know, I could tell you sorry. for If I could smack someone and say sorry, smack them again. It doesn't mean that I'm sorry. Right. It means I'm doing lip service. Right. 
All right, a lot of you know about that with your spouses. They say they're sorry and they do the same thing again. I'm not talking about my wife. I'm just... <laughs> I'm just giving you an example. Brothers, brothers and sisters, they say sorry and then they do the same thing again. They, they don't care about your feelings. And they do... That's not really sorry. So with the new covenant of grace, if you're sorry... You go genuinely to Jesus. You don't have to wait for a certain time of year to do a certain religious duty. You don't have to wait to go to the Holy of Holies one time a year, Passover. You can access the Holy Spirit right now. That's the new covenant of grace. That's where we're in now. And the, the relevance to your question that I'm bringing up is the baptism with water was symbolic of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now think about what happens when you go underwater. When you go into water, water will reach every single part of you. You'll be completely covered in it. Every crevice and crack will have water in it. It will completely consume you. I mean, you can go in a lot of things that won't do that. But water will get to every part of you. So in other words, it's taken over completely. You're coming out a new person, and it's symbolic of the Holy Spirit, how it can completely change you, and you become a new man. And we'll, we'll get back to that later because I'm sure uh, Pastor Robert will share some good stuff about that when we close. It's about, uh, should we start the test maybe? We're, we're going to do a test tonight. So I'm not really sure. I think I'm going to do this test tonight and then I think we're going to probably grade it next week. So I, don't, I have like 100 pencils, but I had no pencil sharpener. So it's like that guy in the Twilight Zone... He, all he, yeah, just give everybody a crayon. This is like a kindergarten test. Everyone, everybody take a crayon, whether you've been here or not. Everyone take a piece of paper. Everybody get a crayon. The guy in the Twilight Zone had all the books, but he, his glasses were broke. He stepped on his glasses and broke them. All he wanted to do was read. That was like me before, looking for a sharpener. <laughs> Had uh, 200 pencils, no sharpener. <laughs> Take one and pass it. You could share or do separate, whatever you want to do. I'm going to post everyone's grades on Facebook. Just multiple choice. You're going to write one letter, A, B, C, or D. I think there's 19 or 20 questions. You need one? There you go. Pray. Would, you, would you like one? You don't want to, you can write at the table if you want. You don't have to. If you want to, you, you don't have to. Now, if you'd like to hand this in to me, I'll grade them, but you don't have to. Thank you. Yeah, you can turn the lights on. Either 19 or 20, I forget. If it's 19, I'll probably just make up another one. Get a round number 20. I think so. They'll gradually come up. They'll gradually come up. If you name, that, that'll be question number 20. You get your name right. All, all of the scores will be posted on Facebook. And the church website. <laughs> Sister Pat will get a zero. <laughs> and Lauren. <laughs> well, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read them to you. Yeah, they're too small. All right. What? All right. I'll check it out later. All right. I understand this is a little small. It's my first time. Don't worry. I'm, I'm gonna read them to you. And um, if you're watching at home, you can also, I'll read them, and you can mark them down and, and email them to me. Email your answers to ChristChurchLI at mail.com.
and I can give you a grade if you're watching online. So I'll, I'll read these for you. This is like the test when you got to cover one eye. This is like the small one. That's really tiny. I didn't expect it to be that tiny. All right, you live and you learn. All right, question number one. I'll read them out to you since they're so small on the screen here. Which, and I went over some of this stuff before, so you, if you were paying attention, that's on you. Which of the four Gospels shows a much different picture of Jesus than the other three? A is Matthew. B is Mark. C is Luke. D is John. Which of the four shows a much different picture of Jesus than the other three? Which of the four Gospels shows a much different picture of Jesus than the other three? Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? Matthew's A, Mark's B, Luke C, John D. Don't Google it. Even if you're at home, don't Google it. Don't do it. Do not Google it. You don't learn that way. Google will send you on some rabbit chase where you, next thing you know, you'll be coming out an acidic Jew. Number two, which gospel most emphasizes Christ as king and fulfillment of the Jewish prophecies? Christ as king and fulfillment of the Jewish prophecies. Which gospel most emphasizes Christ as king and fulfillment of the Jewish prophecies? Definitely went over that before. A, this one's out of order. Mark is A. Matthew's B, Luke is C, John is D. So Mark is A, Matthew's B, Luke is C, John is D. Which gospel most emphasizes Christ as king and the fulfillment of the Jewish prophecies? Okay, this one I definitely told you before. Which of the following is not a synoptic gospel, Matthew A, John B. I don't know why these are out of order, sorry. Matthew A, John B, Mark C, or Luke D. Which of the following is not a synoptic gospel? We talked about a synoptic gospel is a summary of, of something. Three of them summarize Jesus' life. One of them does not summarize the events of his life the same way. So which one does not? Which one's not a synoptic gospel? Matthew's A, John B, Mark C, Luke D. True or false? Question number four, true or false? The gospel of John was written by John the Baptist. A is true, B is false. True or false? The gospel of John was written by John the Baptist. A is true, B is false. If you know about what happens to John the Baptist, you would know whether it was possible for him to do something or not do something, if you know John the Baptist's story. So was he the writer? Uh, the, this book was written after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. It was, put, it was penned after that. All right, so A is true and B is false. Gospel of John is written by John the Baptist. Which of these men was not one of Jesus' original 12 apostles? A is Peter. B is Judas. C is Matthew. D is Paul. If you've been in Bible study with us a long time, we went to the movie theater and watched a movie about one of these people. Which of these men was not one of Jesus' original 12 apostles? A is Peter, B is Judas, C is Matthew, D is Paul. We got another true or false here. All four gospel books tell of Jesus' arrest, trial, crucifixion, and resurrection. True or false? A is true. A is true. A is true. And B is false. 
All four gospel books tell us of the arrest of trial, crucifixion, and resurrection. True or false? Number seven. Why might the gospels have been written down? Jesus did not appear to be returning soon. B is all of these. Why might the gospels have been written down? A says Jesus did not appear to be returning soon. Although we know it's soon, but I guess people have a different, like soon like in, in five minutes or soon like in God's perspective. He tells us he's coming soon, but maybe not in our own perspective. It might not be that soon. Uh, B is all of these. C is contemporaries of Jesus were dying out. His apostles were starting to pass away. The people that saw Jesus themselves were starting to move on, and they wanted to make sure that it was recorded, everything that they had seen. And D is that heresies about Jesus were arising, that people were starting to say fake things. So why might the Gospels have been written down? A, Jesus did not appear to be returning soon. B, all of these. C, contemporaries of Jesus were dying out. D, heresies about Jesus were arising. This is um, one that I definitely didn't talk about. I just threw it in there as a learning thing because um, I don't hear it mentioned too much. But um, it, it's for number eight. It says, what is the only gospel that mentions that when Christ was crucified, the graves were opened and many bodies arose? So that's just a special question that I threw in there. But, but that's actually not something that I covered. And it's actually something that I don't hear spoken about too often in general because I think a lot of people don't really understand the whole thing. There, there's a lot of things that we don't understand about this. We, we don't know what happened to these people. We don't know who they were. We don't know what happens after. But it says in one of these books, which one? What is the only gospel that mentions that when Christ was crucified, the graves were opened and many bodies arose? So I'll just, I'll just quickly tell you the names and we'll move to the next question. It's either A, Mark, B, Matthew, C, Luke, D, John. So, it's one of them. What was the gospel writer's main purpose for writing their works? Number nine. What was the gospel writer's main purpose for writing their works. A says they wanted to present a complete biography of Jesus. B is that they were asked to write their accounts for inclusion in the Bible. C, they wanted to show that Jesus was the Savior and the Son of God. Or D, the Roman Emperor Constantine wanted an account of Christianity. What was the gospel writer's main purpose for writing their works? Do I need to read the answers again? Good. Sorry, it's so small. Guess uh, one question a slide next time. When dis number 10, when deciding which four Gospels to choose as can canonical, canon of Scripture being the works that were to be included, the books that were to be part of God's holy word, canonical, canonical, when deciding which four Gospels to choose as canonical, the early church fathers used which of the following criteria? There was a lot of other writings that they could maybe have used, but no, they absolutely could not have used it, but there was, there was a lot of other writings out there. But uh, when they decided to use these four Gospels, what was the criteria that they used to choose the Gospels? Was it A, liturgical use? Liturgical use is a practice that's going on for worship in the church. Uh, were they using, uh, did they use that criteria if it was being used in the church? Would that be a reason to keep it and make it canonical? Um, 
B, universal acceptance. And, you know, I think, I don't know about universal acceptance. I, I think at the time they universally accepted it, but also at the same time there's always going to be people out there. Like the Jews didn't accept it. So I, I don't know if I'm crazy about this question. C, all of these, or D, apostolic origin. They came from the apostles. I, that's a tricky one. I, I don't like the universal acceptance in there because it, obviously there wasn't uni, universal acceptance from everybody. Maybe if we got very uh, specific about it, universal acceptance among the people who created the canon of Scripture, that they all agreed that it was, um, it was right historically, um, no errors. And I'm not talking about putting an A before an E. I'm talking about saying something that's not true. So was it for liturgical use? When they made the canon and decided to use the four Gospels, was it for liturgical use, A? B, universal acceptance. What was the criteria? C, all of these. Or D, apostolic origin. A little bit of a tricky one. It's the way they worded it. I, sometimes you don't know how people, what they're trying to get at with their questions. 11. Which gospel writer also wrote the book of Acts? Okay, I talked about that before. Which gospel writer also wrote the book of Acts? A, Matthew, B, Luke, C, Mark, and D, John. I'm going to get moving for the sake of time. These questions are, are less words, too. Number 12, which gospel, if you need it after, I could show you after if you miss one. Which gospel writer is traditionally thought to have also written, written the book of Revelation? Which gospel thought to also have written the book of Revelation? So he wrote a gospel, and he also wrote the book of Revelation. A, Matthew, B, John, C, Mark, or D, Luke? A, Matthew, B, John, C, Mark, or D, Luke. Which one also wrote the book of Revelation? 13. Which gospel traces the genealogy of Jesus back to Adam? I mentioned this before. Which gospel traces the genealogy of Jesus back to Adam? A, John, B, Matthew, C, Luke, or D, Mark? Ready for the next? Either you know it or you don't, so I'll just move on. All right, number 14. In Matthew chapter 8, we read that Jesus healed the leper. The leper came before Jesus, knelt down and said, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. Jesus, after healing him, told the leper to tell no one, but to go to the priest and offer the gift that blank commanded. Offer the gift that blank commanded. He told the leper to tell no one, but to go to the priest and offer the gift that blank commanded. A, God. B, Moses. C, priest. D, Solomon. I know that is a tough one. That's a tough one because they, they all could kind of be true. I guess you got to kind of remember the verse. He heals the leper. He tells him, don't tell anyone. Go to the priest and offer the gift that blank commanded. A, God, B, Moses, C, priest, D, Solomon. All right, we got six more. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus performs yet another miracle. This time he healed a man with a withered hand. The Pharisees keenly watched the whole thing. What was their interest? A, they wanted to see if Jesus would cure someone on the Sabbath. B, they wanted to see the poor man helped. C, they wanted to learn how to heal people. Or D, they loved Jesus and wanted to support him. I'm gonna keep going. Want me to, again? In Mark chapter three, Jesus performs another miracle, this time he heals a man with a withered hand. The Pharisees keenly watched the whole thing. What was their interest? 
A, they wanted to see if Jesus would cure someone on the Sabbath. B, they wanted to see the poor man helped. C, they wanted to learn how to heal people. D, they loved Jesus and wanted to support him. The Pharisees we're talking about. We're talking about the Pharisees. In John chapter 11, we read about one of the most dramatic miracles performed by Jesus. This was when he raised Lazarus from the dead. How many days had Lazarus been dead before Jesus came to Bethany? A7, B4, C2, D10. How many days was Lazarus dead? before Jesus came to Bethany and raised him. In Matthew chapter 9, we read the account of Jesus as he helped two blind men. The two men had been following Jesus and called out loudly to him for help. How did they refer to Jesus in their appeal? All right, I'll read it again. In Matthew chapter 9, we read the account of Matthew. All right, there's your hint. In Matthew chapter 9, we read the account. We talked about the different books and the personalities of the books and what they proclaim. So if you remember that, that'll help you out a lot here. In Matthew chapter 9, we read about the account of Jesus. And as he he healed two blind men, the two men had been following Jesus and called out loudly, to him for help, how did they refer to Jesus in their appeal? Did they call him A, son of David? Did they call him B, son of man? Did they call him C, son of God? Or did they call him D, son of Moses? In Matthew, would they have called him A, son of God? Matthew wrote it. Or would they call him B, son of man? Would they call him C, son of God? Or D, son of Moses. Good. Next one. All right, 18. And I think I, think I only have 18 and 19. All right. Maybe we'll make up a 20th one. I got to think of something. 18. Jesus uses a parable to convey the messages that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. What is the name of the parable which he uses to convey this message? There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. What's the name of the parable which he uses to convey this message? A is the faithful servant and the evil servant. B is the Pharisee and the tax collector. C is the lost sheep. D is the two sons. The, the, the hint, Brother Jim, is that there's more joy in heaven over the one sinner who repents than over the 99 just persons. That helps you. The faithful servant and the evil servant, or B, the Pharisee and the tax collector, C is the lost sheep. D is the two sons. Number 19. I guess we only have 18 questions. I I thought you couldn't read it. All of a sudden, everyone can read it. Now that I'm done reading them all. You got any questions, Pastor Robert? I want to add. I'd like to get two more questions on here. Get a solid twenty. You could do a true or false, or you could have them write the name of something. Got any questions? Well, I need a nineteen now too. No, I don't want to give any. Number 20. 
to make a laugh and a sweat. Take the Sunday's test. What was Sunday's text? I don't know if we could use that one. <laughs> no, no ABCD. One shot. Wait, what? What was Sunday's text? Book and chapter. What if it's even just a book? No, no, shh. What was Sunday's message about? Just write Jesus. All right, I, I got a neat, I got one. Um, who was sent? I'll just off the top of my head. Who was sent before Jesus to declare that the Messiah was coming? <laughs> write the name of the person. Who, who, yeah, 19. Who, who went before Jesus to tell that the Messiah was coming? The kingdom of heaven was at hand. I, I mean, well, we can use Pastor Roberts as 19 and this is 20. I don't know. All right, then we'll, we'll get another one. We'll get another one too. That's 19. That's 19. That's 19. Who was sent before Jesus to declare the kingdom of heaven is at hand? The Messiah is near. Who went before Jesus to tell everyone? That's 19. <laughs> I got one. All right. We'll do, we'll do a verse for... All right. Revelations... 22, verse 12 and 13. You'll have to fill in the blank. It says, and behold, I am coming soon. And how do I want to word this? I want to leave a blank. My blank is with me. To give every man according to what? Okay, that's what that's what's going to be. Here's number 20. This is Revelations chapter... Don't, go, don't look it up on your phone. Revelations chapter 22, verses 12 and 13. You're going to finish this, this scripture. And I'm going to give you about most of it. Uh, and behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as blank. Don't tell him. My reward is with me to give every man according as. This is number 20. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as blank. Good, I just came up with that one. Why are you gonna look it up? That you just gotta finish the rest of that sentence. It's Revelation chapter twenty-two, verse thirteen. But I, I read twelve before it. I put twelve and thirteen together. But what you're actually finishing is verse thirteen, because twelve is behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, and then thirteen is uh, to give every man according as my reward is with me. I have my reward with me to give my reward to every man according as. It, I want the next. Four words. All right, three. His is the next word. According as his. And then it's three words. 
Or really, if you get the one keyword, it's one key thing. My reward is with me to give every man according as his. According to what is God giving you the reward uh, based on that scripture? 19 was um, who, who came before Jesus to say that the kingdom of heaven was at hand? Before Jesus' ministry began, who went out and told everybody that the kingdom of heaven is at hand? He, uh, he set the way for Jesus to come by telling people that the Messiah was near, the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Who is that person? No, we're using this one as 19. Yeah, we didn't use his. You can write it down as a bonus, though, if you want. We, we're not counting it because people heard it. Well, 19 is actually um, who went before Jesus to say that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Number 19, number 19 is no longer Pastor Roberts. We, we revoke that question. We, next week, we're going to do a recap. I'm going to keep this going if you would like. Next week, we will do as we did tonight. We will go over the, um, the, other, the other half of that timeline because we only got through half of it today, which, of course, we didn't do it all, but uh, you know, we only went through the first page. So next week, we'll go through the second page which the thing that I sent you, it's the one that starts with the woman with the alabaster flask. So that would be either number 21 through 39. So you could pick one of those, you can read up on it, and you could share for a minute or two next Thursday night. And then we'll go over the test. We'll go over the answers. We'll talk about maybe some stuff and get some conversation off the questions. Talk about why it's right. And, you know, some of those questions were a little weird, but I put them in there to lead me to uh, get you to understand something, uh, whether it be with canon of scripture. That, that was a little tricky, that question, but um, I was going somewhere with it. That's why I put it in there, to try to get everyone to understand certain things. But anyway, that, I mean, if you want me to grade it, oh, God, I hate grading it. Oh, man. Maybe I'll just collect them and we'll self-grade. We're in church. We'll go on the honor system. I'm not going to grade them. I, I just, I'm going to have all those papers in front of me, and I'm just, I'm not going to want to grade them. What we'll do is I, I'll collect them all, make sure that your name's on them, and then next week, some of you are going to lie. You, you sh don't lie in church. You're going to... Yeah, there you go. That's why I use the crayons. I thought about that. Does anyone have a pencil sharpener? But the thing is, I have a manual pencil sharpener, so I'm literally going to be doing this for like an hour and a half. You do? If you bring it Sunday, we'll do the pencils. If she forgets it Sunday, then I'm not doing it. All right, it's all on Marissa. No pressure. And if she forgets to bring the pencil sharpener Sunday, and I, I could say that I'll text you, but I'll forget to text you too, and then it'll be my fault. So let's just leave it on her <laughs> right here now. If that's the case, then you'll use a different color crayon and the honor system. All right? And it's crayon, so you can't erase it. So if you'd like, I'll collect them, and then, uh, well, I'll collect them after. Let's just, for the sake of time... Pastor Robert is excited to close. He loves, this, he loves this atmosphere. This is what he loves. This is why he comes to church, to take tests. Pastor Robert's going to close us out tonight.
Okay, everyone. Everyone enjoying their time studying the Word of God tonight? It's a blessing, right? Brother Jim had asked a question before, and uh, I'm going to let him rehearse that question one more time. And you could just say it right from where you are. Let's deal with two things independently. What Denise said about the born again experience and um, baptism in general. John the Baptist falls as a transitional character. Um, my brother said something earlier that uh, I could probably clear up from this standpoint. When Jesus came, um, it's not that he practiced the Judaism that we know of today, which he didn't. We know that he went into the synagogue and disapproved of many of the things which he saw. Uh, what he meant and uh, what is important to understand is he followed the law of God as it was given to that point for mankind to fulfill. And uh, God revealed himself through stages so that people could understand him. Uh, at the fall of man, um, we did not slowly walk away from the Lord. There was a plummet into the dark ages, so to speak, a complete blindness to God the moment that sin entered in. It wasn't like man like slowly walked away from the Lord. He went from being God conscious to completely having no idea and no concept really of who God was, which is what we see in Adam, hiding from God the same God that loved him, the same God that uh, created him. Now he's hiding. His entire concept of God was wrong because of sin. And many people all over the world, their concept of God is wrong because of their sin. They project on God um, what they really feel because of their own mistakes, failures, shortcomings, etc. And so John comes as a transitional character, as a prophet, and the baptism of John really was um, a setting in line of um, people repenting yes. and turning from and realizing that um, what they had done up until that point was um, not adequate, it was not sufficient, it wasn't working. Right. And uh, that they needed to repent of... Um, you know, it's interesting to me how that people can find ways to work within a system, a religious system, and have it work to their advantages where they're not really walking with the Lord. And uh, we find this all across the world. How much can I get away with and still be a Christian, right? How close to the world can I get and still be a believer? Instead, God wants us to ask, how close can we get to him and still be in this world still attached to people that's really the question we should be asking and so john's baptism is a special time and place and point in history in which the proclamation of the coming of the savior would be met by people realizing that they needed a savior with that being said where does baptism coming in the new covenant which is where you got. Does that clear up the first part? I hope I didn't go too far off because, you know, it's easy for me to do. This is all I do is study these things. So sometimes I go deep into things that really weren't the question at all. But uh, as it regards baptism in the new covenant, um, the book of Mark, the 16th chapter, if somebody has it, Verse 16. Megan, you have it? Phone is much slower than I would be with my handheld Bible. 1616. Go ahead, read it. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. 
Think about that for a minute. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. It seems like there's two things on the salvation. At first glance, this is how it looks. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not, it should say, he that believeth not and is not baptized, you would think, would be damned. It's right here that the, uh, the word of God expresses to us what baptism really represents in the new covenant. My brother said symbolically it represents the, uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which it does. The spirit of Christ, for there is one spirit, scripture teaches us. And that this spirit of Christ that comes upon us and that uh, we are empowered as we are risen from our sin. But what is New Testament baptism really getting to? Everyone say reflex. Say it again, reflex. <laughs> When someone hits you in that reflexive place in your knee, what happens? If you pick up a hammer and you hit your finger, we realize how much you still need the Lord. When women you are, and men, when you are cooking on the stove and the oil from the pan shoots up and hits you, can I get an amen if that's ever happened to you? Your reflex is what? You express something. There is a, ref, a reflex of expression the moment that you are saved. Baptism is not a criteria for salvation as the Bible says that we're saved not by works lest any man should boast. And um, someone, um, I suppose someone could pretend and put their faith in baptism and think that water would save them. But, you know, that would seem a little ridiculous seeming that people die in the water. They drowned in water, so, you know, I wouldn't put my trust in water. Would you? So then baptism is the reflex of salvation. The moment that you get saved, now you want to proclaim and make public confession. You want to demonstrate and display and express that Jesus has come into your life. And you, so you do so by baptism. That's why it said, he that believeth and is baptized. In other words, he that is presently believing, walking in salvation, desiring to fulfill and express salvation, he would be baptized. And of course, from baptism, continue on into all the good things that God called us to do. Make a little sense? It's expression. Anyone else? We didn't get to. Did you have a question on what Sister Denise shared before we close this out? That, that closed everything as far as. So baptism is extremely important, but it's it's in it's um it's the reflex of your salvation. Uh, anyone that is saved would want to be baptized. Yes. Anyone that is saved would want to do good works would want to follow the plans that Jesus has for their life, not the other way around. Yes? So what happened to those people that confess it as Christ and they die? And they, they didn't get baptized. 
exactly the point that salvation is independent of baptism as far as ultimate salvation. The Bible in Mark 16 is not dealing with the criteria for salvation. It's dealing with the process of salvation. If you believe, then you would want to be baptized. Obviously, if the heart was willing and you passed away before there was a water baptism, the Lord is not saying, aha, I got you. He never teaches that. By grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. There's no boasting in the flesh. There is uh, no boasting in, yeah. When you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, um, it is possible. This is a, a, a big debate in the modern church today, whether um, speaking in tongues is the single evidence of the, of the spirit baptism. And um, there are degrees. This is deep as far as what the baptism of the Holy Spirit versus the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which um, I can just sum it up this way. We could go into this another time. But uh, one is you get in the water, and one is the water gets in you. And they are separate and distinct works of God. Um, any man that claims to completely have these things down, uh, don't listen to them. Get away from prideful men that think they know it all. Nobody has this completely down. What we do know is that uh, they are separate and distinct works. So when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're in the water. When Jesus said to the disciples, receive ye the Holy Ghost, they didn't speak with tongues. They did nothing. But there was an indwelling of God's presence in them something that kept them through some of the most difficult times that they would ever go through. And uh, anyone to disclaim or to dismiss that wouldn't be looking at the full picture, which a lot of religious uh, organizations, denominations do. They're so staunch on their theology, they're not open to address what the Word of God is actually presenting to us, which there are other ways in which God does things, ultimately bringing about the fact that there are two distinct works, an indwelling, and a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that expression is unique. You know, Peter got up on the day of Pentecost while they were all speaking in tongues. He spoke in, in, in the language that everyone understood. He wasn't speaking in tongues looking like a drunk man like many of the others. So uh, that's something that's not often addressed. So there's a lot to this. But you should always be praying that you should speak in other tongues. It's of extreme value. Uh, it's more valuable than I could ever express. But um, to think that you're a lesser believer, if you're not at that level or God has not given you that yet, it is, uh, is dismissive, it's um, oversimplifying, and it's really not of God to approach things from that perspective. Another thing with um, being what I heard is being baptized with the Holy Spirit means you are impregnated with God's spirit, his seed that's big, that's implanted in you now, and it's you have to birth. Yeah, but here's the thing. Here's the thing, and I'll let you leave on this one. Once a baby's impregnated in you, do you make it grow? Once it's there, no. Here's the challenge. Here's the amazing, remarkable work of God in the born again, being born again, not of corruptible seed. What do we do? I'll leave you with that one. That's a big, that's a big deal. That's not one I'm going to deal with right now. There's not enough time because once, you know, when, when I had a baby, there was only, you know, so much that we could do. And then that's it right. was just God that did the work, right. you know. 
It's just, it's over. And God does it. So how much, these are complex issues probably, uh, some of which are, uh, sometimes questions like this get rooted in pride, attempting to know more than what is written. Amen. Always remember, never try to be wise above what is written. It's amazing to me how many people, when they start studying the Bible, find everything they think that is wrong with it. And every year I study it, I find, oh, that's what it meant. I didn't get it 10, 15 years ago, but I get it now. So don't attempt to be wise. You know, if you find something you don't understand, keep going. And when you find something you do understand, practice that. Put that into play. And little by little, here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, God will make it plain and clear to you in the future, okay? Okay, that, that's all the time we have for questions tonight. But I, I do, um, do want to leave you with just two things. Um, this Sunday when you come into church, I want to remind you um, what the criteria really is for revival and seeing the Holy Spirit really manifest in unparalleled ways. And uh, there are a lot of people that are dry in this world. They are empty. But I, I suppose that's not the criteria because they are filling themselves with alcohol, with drugs, with, um, you know, all types of different wrong behaviors and uh, bad relationships. So what is the criteria for revival and for the moving of the Holy Spirit? Jesus said, if any man thirst let him come unto me David said as the deer panteth for the water so my soul thirsteth or longeth after thee I want you to pray over the next couple of days that you would have a thirst and a desire for God like never before this is always the criteria that displays whether you are walking healthy with a healthy relationship with God. How many have ever been really sick? What's the first thing that goes when you're really sick? Your appetite. You don't want to eat. You don't want to drink. They have to force you to drink ginger ale that the bubbles are out like my nanny used to make me do. And you don't want to drink it. The first thing to go is your hunger and your thirst. That's how you know if you're spiritually healthy. So I want you to pray that God would give you a hunger and a thirst for him. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight? Close your eyes. Let's pray for a moment. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord God, that you would send a hunger and a thirst, Lord God, that your people would be thirsty for your presence, Lord, that they would want more of you and they would want your presence to come in and touch them, minister to them, Lord. Lord, that you would make this church a place that not only needs you but wants you to show up every week, Lord. Lord, make this house a house of revival, a house where there is an outpouring of your spirit, where signs and wonders follow them that believe. And Lord, demons are chased and minds are made clear and hearts are changed, Lord, and bodies are healed. And Lord, Lord, focus is given and destiny is revealed. Make this a house, Lord, of prayer, a house that desires you, Lord. And we give all, you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Now stretch your hands toward our dear sister Cheryl tonight. Stretch your hands towards her. I want to pray for her. She had two losses in her family 
this week. And uh, she's been on my heart all week. I, I didn't know why. I just was worried when I didn't see her. But uh, let's just pray for her. Lord God, we know not what to pray as we ought. We really don't know what to say as we should. But Lord, the Spirit gives us utterance. And Lord, we pray. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. A precious comforter. Come now, Lord. Overtake her emotions, her mind. Fill her with peace. Peace that passes understanding. Let it guide her heart and her mind. Come on, church, pray for the dear sister. Pray for her family like it was your family. her in perfect peace, Lord. Help her to keep her eyes stayed on you. Help her in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we weep with them that weep. We thank you, Lord, that you're able to do what our words and our thoughts can't do. Minister to her in the mighty name of Jesus. We all said in agreement, amen. Amen. This is why we gather, right? This is real stuff. And uh, it's awesome. We get to study the Bible, and then uh, afterwards we just put it into play. It's what Jesus did. Prayed for those that were hurting. And, uh, we're all hurting at times. Yeah. There's no one that uh, won't go through sorrow, but there's not a sorrow that we'll face. Yeah. He bore our griefs, and he carried our sorrows. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Last but not least... I want to remind you that this is a normal service night, although that uh, we're out here and uh, we're believing that you're going to stand with the church in tithes and offerings and help us to continue to do what we do. And uh, I know all of you that work hard, uh, you already know what's necessary. It's funny to me, every time I hear someone complain about uh, church offerings or things like that, uh, 10 out of 10, they don't work. 10 out of 10. Or, you know, they're just bad with money. Everyone that knows what it costs and the expenses that it requires to live, they never have a problem with it. So uh, we're thankful that God has sent us some of the best people that love the Lord and love his work and uh, care for it. So if you need an offering envelope, put your hand up. The usher's coming around. And uh, we're going to stand and pray for the church when you have your offering. When you have your offering, you can stand when it's done. And Now, Angel, would you pray for the offering tonight? You scared?
Jake's so default. <laughs> Let's do it together. Let's do it together. We'll do it together. Right? Say, dear Lord Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus. We just thank you for this church. We just thank you for this church. We thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for the opportunity. To give back. To give back. And to bless this and, house. And to bless this house. We ask, Lord. We ask, Lord. That you just touch each and every one here. That you touch each and every one here. You bless us. Bless us. That we can be a blessing. That we can be a blessing. We ask that you bless this house. We ask that you bless this house. And that there would be no lack. And that there would be no lack. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. When you have your offering, you can come place it in the basket at the front and have a wonderful evening. We'll see you on Sunday.